let us come to a time of preaching of God's word. And I would like that you kindly turn to your Bibles to the book of Romans and chapter 8, which was read to us. We want to consider uh, verses um, 18, we want to consider verses 18 through to 20, 28, verses 18 through to 28, Romans and chapter 8. Like I said, today we would have been doing biblical parenting um, or Christian parenting uh, by Pastor Tony, but because I am stepping in for him, I am coming up with a topical. And if you want a title to my sermon, uh, it is uh, The Christian Life, a life of agony, yet a life of joy. Life of agony, yet a life of joy. Allow me to read it again because it is a short passage before I try my best to expose it to our hearing and hopefully for our help as believers. Says the word of God, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope, for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let us pray. Our Father, as we come to this portion of your word, we pray for the enablement of the Holy Spirit of God. He who knows your mind, he who speaks with you face to face, he who intercedes on our behalf, may he now intercede that our preaching and our listening would not be in vain, that we would forget about ourselves and align our hearts with that of God from your word. Bless it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, when Pastor told me that he had been robbed, I was away in the countryside with my wife. And um, immediately it got me thinking that maybe with that kind of trauma, he may not stand up to preach. I therefore immediately started thinking of the possibility that I was going to preach this morning. Very short notice, indeed. So in the morning, uh, we called his house to just find out how he had woken up, and we were told that he was sleeping. Uh, and that was at 8 in the morning. He was sleeping, 
he had been traumatized in the night, he had not slept, and that he had only fallen asleep around 5 o'clock in the morning. And so my wife told me, you know what, you, you are definitely going to preach. Go to your office, look for your sermons. If you can find even an old sermon you've preached, come and preach it again. And that's what I did. I had to go to the office and try my best to get a sermon to come and preach. And all along my mind was in the trouble that our pastor went through. And I couldn't help thinking of Romans chapter 8 verse 28. The providence of God that he lets even sufferings befall us. It kept on in my mind, in my mind. And so today's sermon is about this life we live as Christians. A life that is joyful because we know God. But a life that also sometimes comes with a lot of hardship. First John and chapter 3 verse 2 has always been an encouragement to me. First John chapter 3 verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We know we are the sons of God. But what we will be, we still do not know. We do not know how it will turn out. But one thing also we know is that when he appears, we shall see him and we shall be like him. And this is sort of the theme that Paul brings into light as he writes this last portion of chapter 8 of Romans, connecting it with chapter uh, with up to verse 28. He's dealing with the theme that even believers can suffer. That even believers can suffer. But he also deals with another theme that in that coin of suffering, the back side of it is that there is this glorification of believers that we all look forward to. And so sometimes when I'm personally beset by troubles and anxiety, I always go back to that portion of scripture. First John 3, 2 John 3.2 To help my heart to realize that yes, I am a child of God. Yes, I am going through difficulties and struggles. But one day, I will be like Christ because I will see him as he is. You look around you and you can see, like Bonnie was saying in the morning, people aging. People aging. People dying. Life is decaying. Life is decaying. It is deteriorating. Our physical bodies are growing weaker, older. But I have to say myself, to myself, it does not yet appear what we shall be. We still do not know how it will go. But our hope is in that fact that in the great day of the Lord, that day whose date and time we still yet do not know as we were taught in the Bible study, we will see Christ and we will be glorified. We will see Christ and we will be glorified. And these are the themes that Paul is linking up together. 
as he writes Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Now, in verse 17, he states like this. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. And this verse links together two things that we probably would not put together, sufferings and glory, hearts and hallelujahs, pain and joy brought together. Even in 2 Corinthians and chapter 4, I want you to turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, the apostle again links together joy and suffering. Chapter 2, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, sorry, verse 17, says the scriptures, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Outweighs what? Outweighs those momentary trials and troubles. In fact, the apostle considers them light. That the sufferings that we have here are light and momentary. So our suffering as believers, emotional, physical, traumatic, whatever they may be, sicknesses, are direct, directly linked to the glory that awaits us. And here I'm talking specifically about believers. Our struggles as believers, our lives as believers, our tribulations as believers. Now, there are two types of sufferings. There are those sufferings that are there because we are Christians. In other words, we are being persecuted for what we believe. Suffering for the faith. And that itself also cannot be compared with the glory that awaits us. But there is also another kind of suffering. Suffering by the Christian merely because you are on earth. Merely because you live here. You who is a son of God, a child of God, a daughter of God. Who has been called by the name of Christ. You experience certain suffering by, by reason only that you are on earth. So that when pastor is walking from the church house going to find means to get to the house, some people just come and rob him. For nothing wrong that he has done. He was only coming from service. That is the second type of suffering for the Christian. That suffering is not any persecution because you are a Christian. No, no, no. no. It is suffering just because you, you happen to be around here. You haven't died. You happen to be alive. Both kinds of sufferings that we endure as Christians, both those two types, Paul says they are light and momentary. They are light and momentary troubles, but that they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. An eternal glory that you cannot compare with those light and momentary troubles. The important thing we need to see is that both the sufferings and the glory are privileges that God gives to the believer. 
their privileges. You know, it is easy for any Christian reading these passages to start thinking that um, if something is, you know, I, I should be in places where I can suffer. Right? I should go to a place where uh, I will be beaten, then I can suffer, then that is now uh, for glory, isn't it? That, like, um, if, if I suffer more, if I expose myself to more suffering, then I'm building for myself more glory. Eh? No, no, no. That is, not, that is not how you should look at it. You should see that for you, for God to let you suffer is a privilege. Similar to him allowing you to be glorified on the day of the Lord. Both the glory and the suffering are privileges that the Lord allows us to pass through, to experience. We cannot earn glory. We cannot earn glory. Glory is given as part of Christ's inheritance. And so is suffering. Suffering is a privilege that we are permitted providentially to experience. And so Paul writing to the Romans, says that when we suffer as believers, our hearts should not be dampened because there is a glory that awaits us and it is yet to be revealed. Why do I say that the other part of suffering is just because we are around here? Where do I get that from? Well, I get it from verse 19. Because we are told that the creation also, in other words, even all the other created things, animals, the vegetation, the trees, the fish that is in the sea, in the ocean, in the lake, the birds of the air, the entire creation is groaning because of the weight of sin. And it is that sin that causes the earth to suffer. And so that the creation itself is groaning with eager expectations for the day of the glorifications of the sons of God. If you watch news, you know that Lake Victoria, which hitherto was teeming with all types of fish, is now not having sufficient fish. In fact, these days, people are having fish cages in the lake. People now are saying, this fish in the lake is mine. I am growing it. It is my farm. Have you heard of cage fishing, cage farming, or fish, something like that? It was not there before when I was a little boy. Who would dare even think of going to farm fish in the lake? There was enough there. But because of the greed that has been brought about by the sinfulness of man, we have gone there and overfished, taken more than we needed. Despite the government ban on fishing in, with, with small nets to allow the small fish to grow, we continue because we are evil to go and overfish. What about the vegetation around us? Forests have been cut down. Yesterday we were at home in the countryside and I was telling a friend of mine who was there with me that when I was a little boy, there are trees I used to see here that no longer are here. They are extinct. They have all been cut and burned into charcoal because of the selfishness of humanity because we are a sinful generation. The animals in the parks, 
you have all heard that there are certain types of rhinoceros that no longer are in our parks. Hitherto, they were there. And what have people taken them out for? Eighty for their horns, not even to eat them, not even for food. Elephants are being killed. The creation is groaning. The creation is groaning. Because of the sinfulness of man. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. To share with you that indeed suffering is a privilege granted to us. Because that is what Paul also tells the Philippians. Chapter 1 and verse 29 says the word of God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul is saying, I am still suffering, I am still in prison. The sinful of, sinfulness of humanity has caused it that the world is not a pleasant place to stay in. This suffering that I'm going through is a privilege that it has been granted to you to suffer just as I am also suffering. And you know, in the early part of Acts, it is recorded that the Christians actually considered it, counted it as a joy and a privilege when they actually suffered. They rejoiced in their sufferings. They rejoiced because it was counted, they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though they were beaten and mistreated for his name's sake, they went away rejoicing. Stephen, in Acts and chapter 7, after he was stoned, goes away to heaven asking God in the words of Christ, do not, do not take it out on them. They know not what they are doing. Forgive them, Father. He counted it joy to be stoned for Christ. Brethren, we can only rejoice in our sufferings. We can only have a heart that bears with our sufferings if we see that suffering is a privilege that God allows on the Christian. Remember the refrain in verse 28 of chapter 8 of Romans. He works all things good for those who love him and are called by his name. Still on Christian suffering, you remember Matthew? In the Beatitudes, Deaconemos has been helping us with those homilies every time we come here on Wednesday evenings. And in the Beatitudes that are recorded in Matthew chapter 5, Christ our Lord and Savior says, Blessed are you when men persecute you. When you suffer, and especially when they persecute you, persecute you, False on false allegations for my name's sake. And they say all manner of evil things about you. Great is your reward in heaven. When you are glorified on the day of the Lord. Oh, what a joy. Those momentary sufferings will be nothing in comparison. Rejoice and exceedingly be glad. In fact, Christ says that even the prophets that came before us were persecuted. They also struggled with sufferings, yet they were believers. So then sometimes when you suffer as a Christian, it may trouble your heart. And you may say, how is it that I'm suffering? 
How is it that of all the people who are walking on that road, it is only pastor who was being robbed? Why would God allow it? Oh, but maybe to help us see how the sinfulness of humanity has brought the humanity down to the ground and turned him into a beast. Into a beast who is willing to take another person's life for a mere phone. How it has degraded us. Sin has made us so unreasonable. We are so bad even in our own eyes. Maybe the Lord just wants us to see how bad we have become. Because sometimes we do not know that sin is truly sin. Oh, that we would go out and share the gospel of grace and seek to sound it to everyone to hear. Oh, that the people living around here would see this church and come in and hear the gospel of salvation and turn from their wicked ways to the Lord of glory who saves all who plead to him. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. It is sin. It is a sinfulness of humanity that has also brought frustration to the creation that God had made. But they are groaning also alongside us. Groaning that they will be liberated from this bondage of sin and decay. So that they too may be brought to the glorious freedom of the children of God. These, my brothers and sisters, are momentary sufferings. These are momentary sufferings that we go through. Now, as we look again at the theme of this agony, this pain that we go through living life here on earth, and the glorious inheritance that awaits us, we see the apostle using the imagery of childbirth. In verse 22, those of our mothers, our sisters, and mothers who have had the privilege of giving birth will tell you that it is probably one of the most painful experiences that any lady goes through. In any event, when we were doing the beginnings, and Pastor Tony was teaching us, we saw how God, in his judgment on account of sin, had sworn that childbirth would be a painful experience. In fact, he said he would multiply the pain. And our ladies would tell you that it truly is a painful experience. Except you go through CS, natural birth is a difficult, a difficult, a difficult experience. We see it even with our domestic animals at home. As our cows are giving birth, they struggle. You see pain and agony, they groan. And if it wasn't that we are there to help, oh, it is a painful experience. Yet, when children have been brought forth by those ladies who were in tears, in pain, and crying, and wailing, and mourning, there is joy. They smile through their tears as they see their children, gifts, bundles of joy brought into their laps by their Lord and God. And so in verse 22, the apostle likes, likens 
that suffering, that momentary suffering that we go through, to the childbirth pains that our ladies go through, and the joy that comes after, the glorious freedom that we then experience. And so he says that we believers who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that means into us Christians, the Spirit has been deposited. We have him in our lives. He lives in us. And so we would assume that because the Spirit of God lives in us, that we would then be free from any suffering. But that is not so. A magnificent prospect, nevertheless, awaits us. All through the scriptures, from the Old Testament through to the New One, the prophets in their writings continue to speak of these rumors of the coming days when all the heart and the heartache and injustice and weaknesses and the suffering that we experience in this present world will result in a time of blessing, a time of inexplicable joy upon the earth. It starts as a whisper in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 16, it starts there that a child, a child, the child of the woman will rescue you. He will crush the head of this serpent. Even though the serpent may, may, may bite his heel, yet he will crush the head of that serpent. And it comes on. And the prophet Isaiah comes later in life and speaks of this child who will be born, on whose shoulders the kingdom of God will rest. David is promised that a person from his line will sit on his throne and will see to it that the throne of David would last forever. When I heard of that robbery yesterday, I remembered an incident that happened to my wife and I. When some gunmen accosted at us at, at our gate in the year 2009, and they wanted to rob us, providentially the Lord enabled us to escape from them. They shot at us. Because it was in the night, at about 11 in the night. And when we ran to the police station and the police heard that those men were armed, they even refused to accompany us back to the compound. And they just dilly-dallied. They pretended to be recording our statements. Eventually, by the time we went back home, obviously the thieves were long gone. It was almost two hours later. Which thief would still be waiting at your gate after two hours? But I remember that night, my wife was traumatized. She was shaking like a leaf. She was in shock. And we could not sleep. And it was also on a Saturday night, coincidentally. And I remember that the following day, we could not come to church. Because we were really traumatized. Right about the same time, Pastor Sam was also accosted by gunmen here at Migosi as he was dropping polo dera. And they hit him with a, the butt of a gun and he had a scar on his head. This world is full of the results of sin. And so I was somehow able to relate when my pastor told me that, you know, pastor was traumatized in the night. I was able to somehow, not fully, but at least in a small way relate to what you, brother, may have been going through. Our sufferings will hurt us. I know. They hurt us. I'm not trying to make light of them. I'm not trying to diminish the terrible pain and physical and emotional struggles that we go through on account of suffering or that suffering brings to us. I'm not trying to minimize it. It can be awful. 
can be awful. Almost unbearable at times. Some of them are very intense in, 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 in the way they affect our minds. And sometimes we think we can no longer endure. Sufferings in, that, that children endure in the hands of their parents, that wives endure in the hands of their unreasonable husbands, sufferings that men endure in marriage because of unreasonable wives, sufferings that we endure as communities in the hands of an unreasonable governance. Suffering can be terrible, even for us as believers. But Paul goes out of his way to describe this thing, this hope. And he says, the mere fact that we have not seen it doesn't mean it is there. Who is it who, who hopes for what he already has? It would not be hope anymore, he says. Let us hope for that which we have not received. Let us trust in God who has said that there is a glory that is awaiting every believer. And the Spirit of God is there to help us in our weakness. Sometimes we suffer until we do not know even how to pray. We go before God and we can barely, we don't even know how to present our problem to God. Because we have suffered so much. The world is against us. We, we, we are looking for jobs and the jobs are not coming. And those who, who have not even done as well in school as we have done are getting, they are being headhunted. They are being headhunted. Because they know someone who knows someone. And so when we go back to our closets with our sufferings, we don't even know. Look at the context in which now it is said the Spirit is praying for you. You know sometimes these things are taken out of context. Look at the context in which now Paul says that because of suffering you may not even know how to pray, but don't worry. The Spirit of God is interceding on your behalf with groans that even words cannot express. Because God, who has allowed us the privilege of suffering, remembers that we are His children. That we are supposed to be going to glory. Are you with me? God knows. And so even in those moments when troubles beset us, and we cannot pray. Look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts, and he, who is he who searches our hearts? The Spirit of God. It is he who searches our hearts. Even in times of those momentary troubles and pains, he searches our hearts. He sees our tears. He sees our broken emotions. He knows our struggles. He searches our hearts. He knows the mind of the Spirit. He knows the mind of God. He goes before God and He prays for you and He prays for me. Because He intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. The Spirit knows God's will. And so He intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The context in which the Spirit, we are told, is praying for us is in the context of struggling Christians vis-a-vis -vis future glory. That is the biblical context. Struggling Christians vis-a-vis -vis future glory. 
Spirit prays for us. There is not enough time to preach this. And so I will not speak much of that glory. But suffice it to say that Paul himself is saying that it is incomparable. In other words, there is nothing that we have seen on earth with which we can compare it. Our minds cannot start because it will be futile. Our minds cannot start to even think of what glorious thing it will be. You know, there is something that comes right there in verse 26 and which I am closing with. It is a thought that I want you to see no, in verse 18 where we started. It says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Do you see that word in us? In other words, it will not be revealed before us to see. We will not be sitting in some stadium looking at the glory and enjoying. No, no, no. We will be participants. That glory will be revealed inside of us. We will be that glory. It is the Christian who is going to be participant in heaven. We will be the glory of Christ presented before his Father. What trouble is it, therefore, that can discourage us as believers? What pain, what suffering? Instead, let us rejoice and be thankful that God knows us, that he has called us his sons and daughters, that even in those moments when we are struggling with life, the Spirit of God prays for us. And therefore, he says, and we know. In other words, it is not something being suggested. It is a statement of fact. And we know that in all things, good or bad, fair or unfair in our eyes, painful or joyful, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts.